Do you have breakthrough bleeding on your combined HRT? I'm Dr. Nagat, an NHS GP with a specialist interest in women's health and the author of The Knowledge, Your Guide to Female Health from Menstruation to the Menopause. If you're taking gels, spray or patches alongside your micronized progesterone, which is Eutrogestan or Gepritix, then the guidelines from the British Menopause Society have been updated as always, let me explain what that means for you. And most importantly, please do not panic. This is just guidance. And as always, please talk to a GP or menopause doctor for further advice regarding your individual care based on the hormone replacement, the type, the regime, the amount that you're taking. The new guidelines on how to manage unscheduled bleeding on HRT are now available on the British Menopause Society. A lot of you reached out, I've spoken to a lot of colleagues, but what I'm going to do in this short video is clarify the relevant points for you. The most important thing to note is that most bleeding on HRT does not have a worrying cause, but it does need to be checked out. And if it's not settling within the time frame that we would expect it to, or it's getting worse, or you're getting other symptoms, then that's even more reason to go and have a discussion with your doctor or look at your HRT regime. The guidance now is HRT does not need to be stopped while undergoing investigations for unscheduled bleeding, but this might take a little bit longer for every clinician and local guidelines to be updated. The guidelines also have tables categorizing the different doses of estrogen and progesterone, and that dose equivalent will hopefully provide adequate endometrial protection. I've done a whole video around progesterone dosing, so please check that out. There is now lots of advice on when to arrange an ultrasound scan and what to do with the results, and it comes really clearly in a flow dry diagram such as this. So what the diagram shows is that if you've got unscheduled bleeding on HRT, the first thing to do is assess for risk factors and also a bleeding pattern from your patient. Then identify the HRT regime, offer an examination and then consider an ultrasound scan. So it goes down, you basically follow the flow chart. But what it clearly does really well as well is it categorizes the major risk factors for endometrial cancer and the minor risk factors of endometrial cancer. And it's well worth looking at these carefully because the major risk factors for endometrial cancer is a body mass index of over 40, genetic predispositions such as uh, Lynch syndrome and Cowden uh, syndrome as well, and estrogen only HRT. So for a woman who has a womb and she hasn't been given progesterone, then estrogen only HRT, which is something we already knew about, as well as it's taking into account for women who've had 12 months or more of using neurothisterone or the Depo-Vera injection as their endometrial protection. So we should be look at, looking at those women really carefully. And the other thing that to notice for minor risk factors, so a body mass index of 30 to 39 is considered as a minor risk factor for endometrial cancer. Again, unopposed estrogen for greater than three months, uh, but less than six months. And then later on, if you go down, diabetes. So if a patient has diabetes, you also need to consider them as having a risk factor for endometrial cancer as well. And this is really important. If you're perimenopausal and on uh, sequential HRT, then the endometrial lining thickness that you're looking for is seven millimeters. And if you're on continuous combined postmenopausal, then the lining is four millimeters. And that's where you would think about if there are high risk factors for endometrial cancer to sending the patient on a two week pathway to have a hysteroscopy and assessment by gynecology. So I know the new guidelines has caused a bit of a ruffle and it's got a lot of people discussing and conversations around what is considered as moderate or high dosing of estrogen and then counteracting that with the right level of progesterone as well. The most important thing I want you to take away from this is that please do not panic. Unscheduled bleeding is very common in the first three to six months after starting HRT and it often settles with just a few adjustments and I do that with a lot of my patients and that could be adjustments of your progesterone from taking an oral tablet and it could be that you want to consider having say a coil such as a Mirena coil put in and that will get rid of, of any unscheduled problematic bleeding for you. The most important thing is is that the new guidelines are there just to guide us as clinicians it will take a little bit of time, but you have a consistent review with your healthcare professional. And it's on an individual basis and risk factors in regards to progesterone intolerance, whether we do high dosing of progesterone and we go up with the dose with that, whether we put you on a coil, whether we think about hormone replacement therapy in the longer term or a shorter term, or whether we even think about taking off hormone replacement therapy, if that's what you choose, um, and putting you on alternative HRT. Sorry, I'm knocking all my devices around in my room. But I hope that makes a bit of sense and is able to reassure you that 
It's nothing to be panicked about. Bleeding on HRT is normal. I see it a lot in my clinics as well. And it's just about reassuring colleagues now that we've got more stringent advice available for us. But as always, guidelines are guidelines. Um, and as clinicians, what happens is, is that we always put the patient's wishes and look after them and also make sure that we risk assess ever so carefully on an individual base and we tweak and we tweak and we tweak. Leave your comments below and I'll try and answer as many as possible.